Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicolas Rinaudot, and I work for a Swedish company called Besedo, where we do a lot of online content moderation and machine learning. And I'm here tonight because I'd like to talk to you about optics, because I feel we in the Scala community can be a bit weird about it. If you take any other um, functional programming community, such as, say, Haskell, for example, they talk about optics all the time. They even apparently use them every once in a while. But we, in the Scala community, barely even talk about it, don't use it that I can see. And, and I think that one of the reasons for that is because the vocabulary that we use to describe optics is absolutely terrifying. We have um, profound optics, we have fine traversals, foci, lenses, prisms. These are not friendly words. They're more like walls. They're telling you, you have got to be at least this smart to learn optics. Turns out, however, that um, if you do what I did, if you sit down, completely ignore the theory, beautiful though it may be, and, and, and it really is beautiful, but if you ignore that and focus on the actual use cases, optics turn out to be fairly simple to grasp, and for some use cases, extremely useful. And my purpose here tonight is not to make you optics experts, but I want you to understand enough about them and about the times where they could be useful that eventually someday, either in your open, open source work or day work, you encounter one of these cases and remember, oh, this could be an optic thing. And you try it out. And if that works out, please let me know because this is why I'm standing right now in front of you so that you have this moment of enlightenment. Right, so before I actually dive into optics proper though, I need to make a quick detour. I need to make some basic introduction to algebraic data types or ABTs for short. <clears throat> and the way I'm going to do that is by introducing the running example that we'll be using for the rest of the presentation. Um, as I said, um, I work for a Swedish company that does machine learning. And as any company that does something successfully, we've tried doing something as a service. So we had machine learning as a service for a while. And one of the things we had to do was model, um, design data types for our classifiers. And well, the first thing we had to model was a classifier. Uh, in machine learning, a classifier is that magic thing that does linear regression. You put a vector in it, and it yields a probability distribution that tells you what kind of document you passed it. And if you simplify it to the extreme, a classifier is a name which you need to identify it, and a number of classes, because this is how you make sense of the pro probability distribution you get out. In Scala, you would represent it that way. A classifier is a name and a class count, a string and an int. And, and that word, the way I phrase that sentence is very important. I said it was a name and a string. The, um, sorry, a name and an int. That and keyword is very important because this is one of the defining characteristic of product types. They're an aggregation of types using end as the aggregation keyword. And throughout the rest of the talk, I'll be representing them with a diagram as follows, uh, where this is the product type itself. I'm not actually sure how you describe that shape because apparently in, in American English, that's called a trapezoid. And in proper English, it's trapezium. So I'm not sure, just that shape. And I've given it a large base so that it kind of looks like an and mathematical operator. So this is a product type which has arrows bearing the name of the fields as a label and pointing to the type of the field. So this diagram here means classifier has a name which is a string and a class count which is an int. Now we have the classifier, but we were doing that as a service, right? So we needed some sort of authentication mechanism. Um, and we supported two. The basic authentication one, the login and password that you stick into the basic of header. And another one, token-based, where you called an API or a sales representative would give you um, a token that you stuck into an HTTP header and you were authenticated, which in Scala you could represent as follows. Auth is either a token or a login. And remember when I introduced product types, I said A, and B, right now I just said token or login. And that all is not innocent at all. That is one of the defining features of a sum type. It's an aggregation of types using or as a regating keyword, which 
I will be representing with the following diagram of which this time it's, it's again that, that shape with a slim base because it makes it look like an OR mathematical operator. And then the arrows this time don't have any labels, any label because sometimes they don't have field, they are one of the subtypes. And it's dashed because it's not sure whether the arrow is um, fulfilled. You don't know until runtime whether your off is a login or a token, for example. And then that points to one of the alternatives. So here we have off is either a login or a token. Right, so now we have a classifier and we have a way of authenticating to the remote web service to query the classifier. Um, we need some sort of type to bring them together, um, which is going to be something like this. A service is an off and a classifier. So clearly that's a product type because it's one type and another, but it's not just any product type because off is a sum type and classifier is a product type. And this is usually what we mean when we talk about ADTs, it's nested product and sum types. Um, and I'll be ref uh, representing ADTs as for those. Um, nothing really new here, ML service is a product type of classifier and auth. And classifier we know is a product type, so we can expand it to include this time in class count. Auth is a sum type, which is either a login or a token. Then login has a user and a password, and token has a nested token. This was all I wanted to tell you about ADTs. And we got to a complex diagram, but I don't, think, I don't think it's too intimidating now that we've gone through the steps to generate it. And, and the rest of this talk is mostly going to be about taking shortcuts for that diagram. Um, and before we move to optics proper, um, quick recap, product types aggregate values with an end. Some types aggregate web values with an all. And ADTs, well, they're basically nested seven product types. That was what I wanted to say about ADTs. And now we're going to start talking about optics. And the most well known one is lenses. In order to motivate lenses, I would like you to consider the following service. It's got lots of data in, but the one thing I want you to pay attention to at the for the moment is the classifier name. <clears throat> and we had it was not enforced, but it was a convention. We wanted classifier name to be uppercase because it pretty printed better on our end. So our task here is given a service, we wanted to find a way to uppercase the classifier name if, if it was not already in uppercase. In terms of diagram, this would mean this is entire diagram and we want to focus on that. We want to go through the ML service to the classifier, through the classifier to a value of type classifier and through the name, a value of type string and modify that. In Java, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's not something that we like because it uses mutability, but it's hard to argue that what this code does is really very obvious. Not so much in Scala, however. Um, if you pay attention and if you look at the code, you can make out what it actually does, but there's a lot of noise around this, masking the intent of the code. And this is something that's kind of vexing to us as functional programmers because we have our laws and we have our abstractions and we use these to trim the fat, to get rid of a lot of boilerplate because we know the properties of our code and we, we, do, we can rely on them and not um, berate them. Um, so this is a lot of code and much worse than what we have in imperative code. Clearly something needs to be done about that because this is not gonna stand. The, well, the first step we're going to take we are going to create an abstract setter type whose goal is to reach into a structure all the way down. So our structure is going to be ML service all the way down to the classifier name and allow us to modify that, to set that. And it's going to look something like that. Our setter um, has two type parameters. A quick note about that. Nowadays, I tend to use four words for my type parameters. Um, but here I'm using single letters because these are the same letters that the literature on optics are, is going to use. So if you have read papers or inten, intend to read papers on optics, this should be very familiar. Right, so a setter has an S type parameter, which is um, which stands for state, I believe, and it represents the structures that we want to modify. So in our case, an ML service. A is a type of the value we want to modify. So in our case, it's going to be the classifier name, so a string. 
And this setter exposes a set method, which given an A, the classifier name, an S, a service, returns the updated structure, where uh, in our case, it means we have updated the classifier with a new name. And well, if we manage to provide an implementation of that, it's going to do the job, no problem. But it's slightly disappointing. It's not yet great because what I said was, I want to uppercase the name of the classifier. I didn't say set it to a hard-coded value, but really what I meant was get the current value, apply a function on it, and then set it back. And we don't have all the combinators we need to do that yet. So let's add them. We can easily add a get method, which given an S, so given a service, is going to return the A inside. It's going to return the classifier name. And if we have the set and the get, then modify kind of writes itself. Given a function from the old value to the new value, and a structure, we return the updated structure. Hmm. This works. This is good. But something still bothers me. I'm, I've done, I think, something like 15 years of Java. And a setter that has a get method is just not going to be able to. We, I'm, I can't live with that. We, we can't have that. We have to find a better name. And we're doing functional programming. So we have to find a proper FP name. It's got to be somewhat condescending, if possible. It's got to mean absolutely nothing until someone explains it to you and then it's very clear. And in our case, it has to convey the idea that we have a product type and we focus on one of the components of that product type. Focus. Or we could call that a lens, couldn't we? So this is our data type, which is a lens. And we are going to be creating a bunch of these. So let's write some creation helpers. In a companion object, have an apply method, which for a given S and A, returns a lens of S to A by taking a setter and putting that in a set method and a getter and putting that in a get method. So this is going to work, but I want to go slightly further. I want to name a few of these types because, well, if I name them, it means they're important because why would I bother naming them otherwise? And I want you to remember these so that in a few slides, you have an intuition that should help you come up with an idea. And I really want you to have that idea. So I'm going to name this A and S to S, the setter, I'm going to name that set. And the getter, I'm going to name them get. Here's the updated slides, where now, if we have a set and a get of S to A, then we can create a lens of S to A. And now we have all the tools that we need um, to do the tasks that we set out to do which if you remember was doing that, go from ML service through classifier to a value of type classifier, and then from classifier to name, through name to a value of type string. And the way I said that sentence um, clearly seems to imply that it should be done in two steps. First step from ML service to classifier and the second one from classifier to string. So let's try and follow that intuition and see where that leads us. The first step is ML service to classifier. And it is fairly simple to write, it's a lens of a mail service to classifier, where the setter is essentially a proxy to the copy constructor and the getter a proxy to direct field access. Right, so we have the first step. Here's the second step we have to do from classifier to string. It's exactly the same thing. The code is in fact so similar that you could be forgiven for thinking, well, there must be a way of auto-generating that code because it's, it's exactly the same as before. And yes, of course, of course there is. Uh, if we have time, we'll go through that. Um, so we have two lenses, we have two steps, um, and we can now combine them to write this, which, if we're being honest, is frankly quite disappointing, isn't it? It's probably a bit better than what we had before. Uh, stands in a single line, for example, and it does the job. I do get a classifier with an uppercase news 20, but I mean, I wrote that and I can barely read it. So clearly, we're not done yet. We need to go further. We need to make that a bit better. And when I'm faced with this kind of problem, what I usually do is I take the code, stick it into a method, parameterize everything I can, and see whether a pattern emerges. So we're going to try that now. Here's a set name method, which takes a name and a service and applies exactly the same code as before. We can go further than that, though. We can also take the lenses as far as. So now, we have a lens from an service to classifier and a lens from classifier to string. But we don't actually really need to know about these types, do we? We don't really need to know about ML service, classifier and string. 
the only thing we use, the only property of these types that we actually use is the fact that the lenses commute. The first one must end where the first one begins. So if we don't need to know these types, we can turn them into type parameters. And now this is starting to look interesting because if we have here the constraint that both commute, of course, is respected. It's S to A and A to B. And this looks interesting, but if you pay attention, this here should look slightly familiar. Do you remember when I said earlier, um, I'm going to name some things so that you can think about something later. This is a set of S to B. So given a lens of S to A and the lens of A to B, I can build the first half of a lens from S to B, which sounds like something we want to try to do. Could we do the second half? Could we do the get? And yes, of course we can do the get. It's actually quite straightforward. Using the first lens, you get an A out of the S, and the second lens, a B out of the A. What we've done here is we've composed lenses. Given a lens from S to A and a lens from A to B, we have a lens from S to B. And in functional programming, when you're working on a problem, and then suddenly things start to compose together, you know you're on the right track because this is what we want to do. We, we love things that compose, even categorical abstractions compose like functors and applicatives. Not, not monads, because they're rubbish, but everything else does. Um, so we're on a good track. And now that we know how to compose these lenses, we can finally do that final step because we already have MS as a classifier and classifier to string, right? So we can compose them now and have a new lens. So that does exactly what we wanted with this goal, which I find very terse and very, very explicit. If you're more used to dot implementation than functional application, you might still prefer the Java version that I showed earlier. And that's, that's completely fair. Um, this is maybe not a clear win on the imperative way of doing things, but I do feel it's a major improvement. And, and I do like functional, uh, functional applications. So I like this syntax quite a bit. Um, right. So, this is what I wanted to talk to, talk, to tell you about lenses. Lenses are used to focus on specific parts of a product type. And they compose together, which allows you to build arbitrarily deep paths in nested structures. Lenses. Now that we're done with lenses, I talk about prisms and optionals. Remember how for lenses, the motivating example I was using was um, a service and we wanted to modify its classifier name. Well, here, I'm going to try to do the same thing, but instead of focusing on the classifier name, I want to work on the um, user login. So in terms of diagram, we want to go from that to that path, ML service to, off, to login to string. Okay, we've seen before that if we take it one step at a time, we usually get where we want. So let's try that approach. The first step, service to off. That's pretty straightforward. We have a product type, it's a lens. We know how to do that, it's the same code as before. That's fine. This bit here, now that's a bit more disturbing, isn't it? We're not working with a product type, we're working with a sub type. Diagram doesn't look anything like it did before. Um, we don't know how to do that, and we're not sure whether we have the tools to deal with it at the moment. And there's, well, there's two ways we could deal, about, we could deal with that problem. The, the first one, the right one, of course. And then the second one, the one we all thought of when we were faced with that problem, the one we want to try, even though we know it's not going to get us anywhere. We want to try to pretend that the problem doesn't exist. Use a lens and go straight to the username, bypassing the entire problematic error. And <clears throat> well, experience tells us that's probably not going to work. If we ignore a problem, that usually at some point is going to come back and bite us. Um, but that does not mean it's a bad thing to do. Because right now we know there's a problem, but we don't know what the problem is. So if we try to pretend the problem doesn't exist, then he's, we're going to hit the problem, we're going to hit a wall, and then we'll know what the problem is, which is a very good step before fixing it. So let's try to do that. Let's, go, let's take a lens from off to string. Here it is, my lens from off to string. And we get blocked immediately when you try to, to write the get. Because take an off, pattern match on it. If we have a login, then that's fine. We have a user in the login, we can return that. But if we have a token though, token doesn't have a user, does it? Now, when I gave that presentation before, I was told, well, we don't have a user, but we have a token. And a token is of type string, 
users of type string, maybe we could try to appease the type checker. Where I hope, for obvious reasons, I'm not going to do that here because we are same people who write same code. We, we can't get a user from a token. So we can't do that. And we're going to have to do it the hard way. We're going to have to do that step, the off to login. And clearly, lens don't work here. We're going to need a new tool. But before we actually work on the tool, we need to, fade, to, to, to solve a much more important problem. We're going to have to find a name for that tool. Um, remember the, remember the um, tech, tech box, right? It's got to make no sense. It's got to be pretentious. And in our case, we have a sum type and we want to split it into its various parts. Split it, diffract it, maybe. Diffraction, that's going to be cool. A prism, uh, not a huge fan of these names. I um, tend to make fun of them quite a bit. Um, but right, so the prism, it's pretty much like a lens. The type parameter is mean the same thing. We have S, which describes the structure. In our case, it's an off, because we want to take an off and turn that into a login. So we've got an A, which is the, the value that we want to get, the login. Then we have a get method, which takes an S, so we get an off, and we turn that into an option of A. It's an option because you don't always have something to return. If you have an off that happens to be a login, then that's fine, you have a sum of login. But if you have an off, that happens to be a token, you can't return login, right? So you have got to return a non. So there's this notion of optionality to a prism. Then you have sets, which might be a bit surprising, because if you remember, the lenses set method took an A and an S, took the A into the S, updated it, and returned the updated S. And it worked that way because the lens can be thought of as an is a, I'm sorry, as an has a relationship. And a lens describes fields of a product type. Um, a service has a classifier. But a prism, when we work with some type, so we have a prism from auth to login, it's not has a, an auth doesn't have a login. An auth is a login. So that's why we only take an A, the auth, and we stick it inside of the S and replace it completely. So that's why we don't take an S as a parameter, because we just replace the existing S. Right, so we have a prism, going to write a bunch, so we'll need some construction helpers again. In a companion object, apply method with, um, for a given S and A, which has a prism of S to A, by taking setter and putting that in the set method, and a getter and putting that into the get method. But that bit here, that's not going to be very fun to write. How would you write it, for example, for auth to login? You'd have to pattern match on the auth, right? And if it's a login, then return some of the login. If not, return a non. And I don't want to have to write that every single time. So we are going to use a bit of a trick of the Scala language. This from partial thing relies on partial functions because a partial function from S to A, which is a function that's not defined for all S's. In our case, for example, a function from F from auth to A is not defined for all of because some of are not logins, some of are tokens. So it's a partial function. And partial function can be lifted, which means a partial function from S to A can be turned into a total function from S to option of A, which is going to be useful in, I think, two slides. Right, so this is what we want to do. We want to go from off to login, which is going to be a prism from off to login, prism from off to login, where the setter, which Essentially an upcast, isn't it? You get a login and you return that as an off and the type checker is happy because the login is a subtype of off. And the getter, this is where the partial function thing is useful. It's just a pattern match, an incomplete one. I just match on the bit that interests me on the login case and I don't deal with the rest. And since pattern matches are partial functions, this is going to be lifted into the proper setter type of prisms, proper getter type of prisms. So now we have the two steps. We have from MS service to off and from off to login. Problem is, of course, we know how to compose lenses. A lens plus a lens is a lens. But we've no idea how to compose a lens and a prism, do we? Let's see if the tools that we have are good enough to deal with that. A lens and a prism could be a prism, couldn't it? Well, no, no, it couldn't. Because when you have to write the setter, then you get stuck immediately. In the setter, you want to go from B to S. You have a B, 
And you'd like to get that as an S, but you really can't do that. So you can think of it in terms of code, but you could also think of it with the example that we've been working with so far, a lens in a prism. So you go from the ML service to the auth. That's fine. You can, sorry, it's the other way around. Mm, is it? Yes, it's the other way around. Sorry. You have the login and you want to turn the login into an auth. You can do that because you have a prism. You can always upcast a login into an auth. Then you have an auth and you want to turn that into a service. And you can't do that because a service has an auth, sure, but it also has a classifier. So you don't have enough information to create the service. So you can't implement the setter when you only have a lens and a prism. Then could it be a lens? Could it be that a lens and a prism is a lens? Well, no, because you get stuck um, with a getter almost immediately. You get an S, so in our case, that would be a service, and you want to get a login from it. And you can't write that properly because you can go from the service to the auth, no problem, because every single service has an auth. Then not all auth are logins. Sometimes there are tokens. So you can't write that. You could get an option of login, but you can't go from an option of login to a login. So you get stuck here. We need a new tool, don't we? And again, very important, we have to name it. Um, we want something that's kind of a hybrid between lens and prism. It's kind of a lens, but it doesn't always work out because sometimes the, the path that you want to take in the, in, the, in the ABT doesn't exist. That's of course going to be an option. Yeah, the fancy optics um, naming scheme kind of breaks down at this point. Um, I've been told this is actually called an affine traversal, a fin traversal, a fine traversal. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce it. And I'm not going to be using that name because it's so much worse. Uh, so optional. Optional also takes an S. In our case, it's going to be the service. And an A, the login at the bottom of the path that we want to take. And the, get part, the set part is the set of a lens. Given an A and an S, we turn the updated S. Given a service and a login, I return the updated service with a proper login. And a get is a get of a prism. Given an S, given a service, return an option of A, an option of login, because we don't always have a login. And we're going to need to create a bunch of these again, uh, but the code is not very interesting. Uh, nothing special to do here. And then we have to take a quick break, because we know how to compose lenses with lenses, that yields lenses. We've just done lenses with prisms, right? Lenses with prisms is a, an optional. But now we have to do absolutely everything else. And well, we're not going to go through all the code. I'm going to show all the code, but I'm not going to explain all of it. But do pay attention, because there's a pattern that I would like you to pay attention to, 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 to hear, if possible. Prism with prism, yield a prism. Prism with lens, yields an optional. Lens with prism, yields an optional. Optional with optional yields an optional. Optional with prism yields an optional. Prism with optional yields an optional. Optional with lens yields an optional. Lens with optional yields an optional. That's it, we're done. You can start paying attention again. But if you did pay attention, um, you probably heard that there seems to be a lot of optionals in the return parameter. In fact, if you get two lenses, you get the lens. Two prisms, you get a prism. Anything else is an optional. So you will often end up working with optionals when you work with ABTs. Right, so we know how to compose all the things now. We can get back to the, to the task at hand. We have the path, the lens from ML service to off and the prism from off to login. So we can compose them, get an optional. And then we need to do that last step. Login is a product type, so we know we have to use a lens which works at exactly the same time, uh, the same as before. There's nothing mysterious here. We have the entire path, we can compose everything. And now we can write this code, which for a simple function application is going to reach all the way into your ADT and update the login name. And that is where we have a clear win towards imperative um, syntax. Because if I had to write that in Java, there'd, there'd be a lot of as instance of, is instance of, null checks all over the place. And this is just clean, pure, simple, quite like that. What we've seen, prisms are used to explore some types. So we have lenses for product types, 
prisms for some types, and they compose to yield optionals. And optionals are used to go through ADTs, which if you remember, ADTs are nested sum types and product types. So we have lenses for products, prisms for sums, and ADT, um, optionals for nested sums and products. Now, I've spent the last half an hour or so telling you how you need ADTs in order to work with um, lenses. Turns out that was not entirely true. Um, it is true, but it's not the whole truth. It gets better because you can work with things that have ADT-like properties. And I, I want to, ex to explore that. I want to show that for a concrete use case. Um, a quick API that we're going to design together, which I call config path. Um, if you're at all familiar with Circe, the JSON decoding library, uh, and most specifically the JSON path API that it offers, then this example should feel very familiar because I essentially lifted it entirely from, um, from the code. Uh, of course, if you don't know about JSON path at all, this is completely new and original material and you're going to have mind blown. What I want to do is to work with this kind of configuration file. It looks a lot like JSON. It's probably very JSON, to be honest. Um, it's nested key value pairs. So we have user, the key user, which is mapped to the PSNF value inside of the off section. In Scala, we could represent that as a sum type, as config, which is either a value or a section, where a value is a wrapper for just the string as a value, the value as a string, as a section is a wrapper for a map from string to config. So a section maps keys to either values or, or other sections. This is how you get recursive data type because you can go as deep as you needed to. And the previous file that we had, if we wanted to represent it um, using our new data type, it looked like that, where the key user maps to the value psmith inside of the off section. Now, what we're going to try to do is we're going to find a way to allow users to easily reach all the way as deep as they want inside of a configuration um, tree and update values. And given that we're doing a talk on optics, clearly, we're going to be using optics to do that. And the first one, the obvious one that we're going to start by is the prism that allows us to go from a config to, to go from a config to a section and from a config to a value. So we have these two. They're exactly the same code as we've done before. Nothing fancy here. The other optics that we're going to need, and this one is a bit more fancy, is the one that allows us for a given key name to go from a section to a descendant of that section, so to a config, right? And well, what kind of optic do we need for that? Do we need a prism? Well, it can't be a prism because a prism is an is a relationship. And sections, are not their descendants, they have descendants. So it can't be a prism. It could be a lens, but a lens is an, has a relationship that can't fail. You always have the descendant, which in the case of a section is simply not true. You don't have a value for any possible key name. So it's got to be an optional, which we can write as follows. Given a name, I can give you an optional from section to config, where the setter creates a new section with the previous section's children, updated with a new key map, a key value pair. And the getter is just a proxy for map.get, which conveniently returns an option. And well, we're doing well. We have a way of going, exploring as deep as we want. Once we have a section, we can go through, through its descendants. And whenever we have a descendant, we can turn that into either a section or a config or a value, depending on what we want. Um, and this looks comfortable, this looks nice, uh, but the only thing that we still need is a way to refer to the first element of the config. We know how to go from one config to another, but we need one config to start from, right? And this is where things get slightly funky. Um, this is a beautiful non-optional optional. It's an option from config to config, which represents the root of the configuration tree. So when you set it, you just replace the root of the configuration tree, you just ignore whatever you had before, you just set the new root. And the getter is always going to work because you always do have a root. So you always have a root and you turn that. And now that we have all the optics that we need, I give you config path, which wraps 
an optional from config to config, which is the current cursor in the configuration. So it goes from the root of the configuration tree to whatever element you try to get to. You can turn that path into a value by composing our current path with a prism from config to value. Or you can go, you can turn it into a section by composing the current path with uh, the prism from config to section. But importantly, you can pass it a name and create a new config path, which well, it composes the current node as a section, as section, and the child, the, um, the optional we created before to go from a section to one of the descendants. So with that, we could write something like that, an optional from config to value, which goes from the root of the configuration tree, then to classifier, to name, and return that as a value, which is nice. It's, well, it's not bad, but it's not great, is it? I don't like this strings bit. And luckily, Scala has kind of a black magic -y tool to work with that. I don't know if you know about Dynamic. Um, it's a really nice feature, um, not as well known as it probably should, kind of scary as well. So Dynamic is very full featured and I'm going to focus on simply one of these features, but I do encourage you to look at the um, Scala doc for that. It's quite, quite interesting. The feature we need works justly, given a type that is subtype of Dynamic. If we try to access a member that doesn't exist, and here, upcase.bar doesn't exist, upcase doesn't have a bar member, then the compiler is going to turn that into a function, another function application by passing the name of the missing member as a string to the select dynamic method and allow us to run arbitrary code on it, which is why upcase.bar yields bar uppercase. I know it feels kind of dangerous, but it's actually code generation that happens before type checking. So it's completely type safe. There's no need to worry about it, but it, I agree that it does feel kind of like groovy, doesn't it? So it feels a bit black magic -y, but it's perfectly safe and it allows us to rewrite config path to be dynamic. We replace child with select dynamic and now we can write this thing, which is quite a bit nicer. We go from the root to classifier to name and we get that as a value. Almost perfect. Don't like that much, so we're going to name it. We've called it root, and now we can write root.classifier.name.as value, and this is really very clear. And of course, it works exactly as you want. I want to get the classifier name from that conf, and I do get news 20 exactly as I want it. And what I wanted to show you with this example, well, first, is dynamic, because dynamic is really very cool, but that's not the main point. The main point was optics work not only with ADTs, but with any nested immutable data structure. And that was the takeaway from this part of the talk. Now, in closing, if you only remember just the one slide, that's, that's the one you have to remember. Lenses are used to drill down arbitrarily deep into nested product types. Prisms do the same, but for some types. They compose into optionals, which allow you to explore ADTs. And optics work for any immutable nested data structure. They allow you to navigate them quite easily, and that, is a use case I told you about in the introduction. I said, there are a few use cases for which lenses are, sorry, for which optics are really very good. And I want you to know about them so that you can think about them later. So that's it. That's navigating through immutable nested data structure. If you have to do that with any regularity, think optics, because it's going to allow you to have much easier to read code, much easier to maintain code, and, and it's going to make your users much happier because they don't have to do all of these copy, 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 copy thing. And now, do we have any questions?